I want to welcome you to my mini lectures. If you happen to be a student and you are watching this as part of the course, I want to make sure that you understand what I'm doing here. I am going to be conducting a series of short mini lectures that deal straight with issues from our text and our course. These are designed to be a quick review of what you should have already read. Uh, make sure that you don't use this as the only reference because nothing can take the place of reading and and doing the notes and additional sign assignments that we have in class. So uh, with that being said, I am going to go ahead and start on this uh, mini lecture and how it will operate is it is a set of questions and a set of answers and it is designed to be fairly short. So again, make sure you're reading your book on top of this and also getting those notes turned in. <music> We are going to be looking at some big picture questions here and hopefully if you're watching this uh, I'm trying to put in enough visuals and things like that that you can see uh, how things fit together. Uh, it is important to understand these big picture questions because this is more than likely where some of the bigger questions on your essays for the test are going to come from and it's also designed to be something that can help you in the future as far as you know what to expect on the AP exam and those kinds of things as we go back and build upon each chapter. The first big picture question I'm going to address is this question, what motivated and sustained the long distance commerce of the Silk Roads, Sea Roads, and the Sand Road? The desire of elites for hard to find luxury items from distant parts of Eurasia, as well as the accumulation of wealth, especially among merchants who participated in the trade, motivated long distance commerce. Sustaining the commerce were the support of empires and smaller states that benefited directly from the trade, the spread of religious traditions including Islam and Buddhism, the set of shared beliefs that tied merchants and sometimes whole societies together over wide regions, and also the development of technologies like larger ships and magnetic compasses. The second question I want to deal with is why did the Eastern Hemisphere develop long distance trade more extensively than did the societies of the Western Hemisphere? And the response that I would give for that is the Western Hemisphere did not develop the extensive long distance trade as did the East for several reasons, including the absence of large domesticated mammals in the Americas and the absence of large oceanic vessels. The geographical realities of the Americas, especially the narrow bottleneck of Panama, which was largely covered by dense rainforests, made long distance trade more uh, difficult. Finally, the north-south orientation of the Americas, which required uh, agricultural practices to move through and adapt to quite distinct climatic and vegetation zones, hindered east-west expansion and trading. Let's look at our third question. In what ways did commercial exchange foster other changes? Well, commercial exchange frequently provided the incentives and resources for the creation of larger, more powerful states. It provided sustained contact through which cultural influences were also exchanged, as was the case with the spread of Buddhism and Islam. It also facilitated the spread of epidemic diseases beyond local regions with sometimes devastating effects. It resulted in the spread of plants and animals along with technological innovations. It altered consumption patterns, in other words, what people were using, eating, uh, those sorts of things. It encouraged specialization and it diminished the economic self-sufficiency of local societies. People began to focus more on those things that they knew they could get money on, even at the ex expense sometimes of not having enough food. And finally, it was sometimes used as a means of social mobility, with traders often becoming a distinct social group. And now we'll look at our final question. In what ways was Afro-Eurasia a single interacting zone? And in what respects was it a vast region of separate cultures and civilizations? 
first of all, Afro-Eurasia was an interacting zone in that it was a network of exchange that stretched all across the Afro-Eurasian world, and it altered consumption and encouraged peoples across the zone to specialize in producing particular products for sale rather than being self-sufficient. The spread of ideas and diseases across large parts of the interacting zone provides evidence of extensive and sustained contact across long distances. However, it was also a vast region of separate cultures. None of the participants knew the full extent of the zone, for it was really largely a relay trade in which goods were passed down the line, changing hands many times before it reached their final destination. And numerous distinct cultural traditions existed side by side across the zone throughout the period. So the big idea there is when these things were traded, by the time, say, it left China and reached somewhere in Europe, people really had no idea where the stuff came from because not one person, but it was a relay of persons over sometimes a year, two years time that it took to transport it across the continent of Eurasia and Africa as well. So it was not a quick trade, uh, certainly not by our standards today, but uh, hopefully I've explained those big picture questions to you and that will help you out in the long run on your test. Mm -hmm.